Ciao! Welcome to Italy. We've covered classic noble grape varieties and the classic regions of France. Now we venture into Italy, one of the most exciting and complex countries for wine. I say complex because of the sheer number of volume of different types of grapes, regions, and wines. There's an estimated 1,000 different types of Vitis vinifera varieties cultivated in Italy, and it has over 300 different quality regions. To make it more confusing, uh, one grape variety may be called one thing in one region and may be called something entirely different in another region. And wines vary in their style from traditional to, to modern with absolutely no indication on the bottle. What's worse is that the rules for winemaking uh, change by region and, and some producers totally disregard the regulations. So despite all this, Italy makes some of the world's highest quality wines. For all their chaos, the Italians have captured our imaginations, and particularly when it comes to wine, food, and romance. And we can't help it, we, we love them. Italy has a long and rich history with winemaking. Greek settlers may have established vineyards as early as 800 BC. In central Italy, ancient Etruscans were known to produce and trade their own wine. The Romans spread viticulture in their conquests and, and traded wine commercially. However, it's only in the last 40 to 50 years that Italy has been rediscovered and recognized internationally as a high-quality wine producer. Italy is divided into 20 administrative regions. We'll highlight some of the main regions for quality wines and the ones we see most often exported to major markets. There are four main pillars of great Italian wine. They are Barolo and Amarone, which we'll cover in this lecture, and Brunello di Montalcino and Super Tuscan wines, which we'll cover in Lecture 14. There are wines that can compete with classic wines of France. You'll need the following wines for today's lecture. You will need a Barolo, a Barbaresco or a Longhe Nebbiolo. You'll need a Barbera d'Asti or Barbera d'Alba, a white wine from Piedmonte, uh, so Gavi or Arneas, a Pinot Grigio, preferably from Friuli or Alto Adige, a Suave, and an Amarone. Now you may notice that we have wines, we're tasting a really big red wine first, and then we're going to white wines. You don't normally do that. With it, when we taste for professionals, we always go from dry to sweet, light-bodied to full-bodied, less tannin to more tannin. The reason why we're tasting them this way today is because different regions have different focuses for wines, and I want to make sure that you get the highest priority wines first. Now remember the French label, Vin de Table? In Italy, the comparable label is Vino da Tavola. A wine labeled Vino da Tavola can have a, a blend of grapes from anywhere in Italy. However, these wines are technically not allowed to show vintage, variety, or name the estate on the label. In 1963, Italy created its own classification system for labeling quality wines. The first quality level created was called Denominazione di Origine Controllata, or DOC. Today, there are more than 300 wines that have this designation. An even higher quality designation is called Denominazione di Origine Controllata e Garantita, or DOCG. Only 35 wines are allowed this label, and we'll cover a few of these in the next two lectures. The last word, Garantita, means exactly what it sounds like. These wines go through tasting control boards that guarantee the quality and authenticity of the wine. Remember the Appellation Contrôlée, or AC, of France? In Italy, the DOC controls the geographical limits of the region, the types and percentages of grapes and, and uh, the yields and the alcohol content. However, one big difference between France's AC and Italy's DOC is their aging requirements for DOC. Not so for AC. So this is something that we will see also with Spain in Lecture 16. In 1992, a new classification was created to bridge the gap between the lowly uh, Vino da Tavola and DOC. It was called Indicazione Geografica Tipica, uh, or IGT. These are wines made within the 20 specified regions, and unlike Vino da Tavola, these actually can show vintage variety and the name of the state on the label. Now let's visit one of the regions in northern Italy, Piedmont, or Piedmonte. 
I think it's quite logical to start here as these wines, uh, like the classic French wines, are very terroir driven. Piedmont translates to the foot of the mountains. Pretty logical since the Alps are north and west of the region. The most important region for quality wine production in Piedmont is around the 45th parallel, which is about the same latitude as Bordeaux. But unlike Bordeaux with its maritime influence, however, the, the climate of Piedmont is continental, and that means with, with hot summers and very cold winters. The best soils have a high percentage of calcareous matter, as we saw in France. Uh, the topography is also really quite varied. It, it, it creates these little pockets in tiny microclimates, perfect for winemakers to focus on terroir-driven wines. Piedmont was once part of the Savoie Kingdom, a region that at a point in history included Burgundy. This eventually gave Piedmont a glimpse into French viticulture and a head start on developing quality viticulture and winemaking. In fact, the dialect of Italian spoken in Piedmont today sounds more French than it does Italian. South of Piedmont's local capital of Turin is the area of Piedmont's highest quality wines, Barolo and Barbaresco. These wines are made from a great variety called Nebbiolo, which gets its name from the Italian word for fog, Nebbia. Uh, that's a, it, there, it's actually as thick as pea soup. Uh, it's actually terrifying to drive in, I can tell you. Now, in, in the north, Nebbiolo can be called Spana. However, its characteristics are exactly the same. Before we begin, I really should mention that if you haven't already, you should be writing down your tasting notes. What are tasting notes? These are simply your records of how you like the wine and, and what you notice about the wine. But don't feel intimidated and think, oh, I, I have to know exactly what to write. Write down anything. I mean, that's how I started, and I can, it, it absolutely can reveal specific benchmarks for you, as it did for me. Now, you might write down what you think um, are the characteristics of the wine right alongside what, what they're supposed to be. So you can compare the winemaker's opinion with what you've got. It's really important, as I said in the second lecture, to start creating your own vocabulary uh, so of what you smell and taste. The only way you're going to remember what you thought of any of these wines, how it looked, smelled, it tasted to you, is by writing it down and keeping it somewhere for you to compare your notes to. There's a sample tasting sheet for you in the back of your guidebook. You can use this one um, or make your own to get started. So as you go through the demos in this lecture, try taking notes. Now let's take a look at the color of the, I have a Barolo here, but you may have a Barbaresco. Notice the color. Here we have the, the Nebbiolo Barolo, and it's actually quite pale. You can see your fingers through it. And this is quite surprising given the, the intense tannin level of this wine, which we'll taste in a minute. But it's got less anthocyanins or color pigmentation in its skin, which is, gives it that more pale color. Now, when you have wines that, like this that are made in the more traditional style, meaning they're aged for quite a longer period of time, um, they're much paler in color, as opposed to the more modern ones that have a more new French oak or new oak in general, they're gonna be deeper in color because that new oak fixes the color. You'll hear me reference traditional style and modern style throughout these two lectures. These lectures will help you distinguish the two styles and discern your preference for one over the other. Again, that's how your tasting notes are gonna come in handy. Now let's do our chest, chin, nose test for aromatic intensity. Can you smell it here? Uh, I actually can a little bit. Put it up to your chin. Wow, it's actually really quite aromatic. And Nebbiolo is. Nebbiolo is a very aromatic grape variety. But unlike what you see for Cabernet or Merlot or even Pinot Noir, there's very different aromas that you get here. Um, let's, well, let's smell it and see if you get it. Well, you do get strawberry and cherry fruit, but there's also tea leaves and rose petals. That's what it's known for. That's what Nebbiolo is known for, and they can be quite perfumed. But you also get a strong amount of, of minerals in this. And that, again, that points us to the old world that it's made in Europe because you've got that strong minerality. What you're smelling will be affected by the producer and the age of the wine. If you have an international producer such as uh, Charetto or Paolo Scavino, uh, you'll probably smell more of the more obvious notes of, of oak, which is or vanilla and toast. Especially this will be true for a new French oak. On the other hand, 
If you have a more traditional style producer, such as Giacomo Conterno or Prunotto, who ages for longer periods of time in, in old, large Slavonian oak casks, uh, you'll be getting some beautiful spice aromas, uh, something more along the lines of maybe like a brown spice, like cinnamon. And some producers blend these methods of, of French oak and Slavonian oak to get something in between, kind of like Vietti. Now let's taste it. Wow. That is an intense amount of tannin. Feel the saliva just drain from your tongue. It's got an intense amount of tannin, so it's a huge amount of drying sensation. But also notice the sides of your tongue, where we taste acidity, notice that it's got a really high level of acidity there as well. And this high tannin and high acidity is why that Barolo and Barbaresco can age for decades. And this might surprise you, because you might equate really deep color with things that can age for a long time. But as we had seen before, it's a bit pale, so it might not match. The DOCG region of Barolo is known for having the most gripping structure, which we call masculine structure. And its sister region of Barbaresco, also a DOCG, tends to be a bit more perfumed and, and softer in its tannins, and more feminine in comparison. These wines need time, and it's not a joke when they say that they can age for 30 years or more. As they age, they gain in complexity. They add layers of, of spice tones and, and get softer and more perfumed. Remember we mentioned that the wines of Piedmont are more focused on terroir than wines from other regions of Italy? This is why you'll see a specific vineyard name along with Barolo or Barbaresco on the label. Uh, just as in France, these designations are called specific vineyard crews. Here we have an example by Vietti from the Lazarito vineyard, the vineyard crew in Serra Lunga. The vineyard is actually shaped like an amphitheater, and the wines are known to be quite long-lived and spicy. You might compare this to the Roque vineyard in Castiglione Falletto, another vineyard crew, which is known for having one of the firmest and most masculine structures when it comes to tannins of, of any vineyard crew. You may also see the vineyard crew of Canubi, which is the largest Barolo crew and yields quite floral and, and tannic wines, but not as tannic as Roque. Now you see why these wines have a connection to Burgundy? Um, in Italy, we only see vineyard crews treated with such universal respect here in Piedmont. There's another red grape variety in Piedmont called Barbera. Years ago, Barbera was only known as a simple, unoaked, easy drinking red. Uh, while you still see some unoaked examples today, you often see some higher quality producers doing some more with Barbera. Now here we have a, a Barbera also from Vietti, and just to keep it consistent. Let's compare the color. You'll notice right away that the Barbera is much deeper in color than the Nebbiolo. Now let's smell it. I don't really smell it too much at the chest. At the chin you do, you smell it a little bit, but then you stick your nose in the glass. Barbera is known for a, a very cherry kind of aroma with, with strong minerals as well, again, pointing us to the old world. And this one has some, some French oak on it, so I get a little bit of vanilla and toast in it. But if it had Slavonian oak, an older Slavonian oak, um, you wouldn't get those vanilla and toast kind of characteristics. So let's taste it. All right, tasting that right after the Nebbiolo, the Barolo or Barbaresco, it's going to seem much softer to you. Now, Barbera is a very high acid grape variety, just like Nebbiolo, but you don't have the tannins there. The tannin is much, much softer. The, I mean, these, the fruit, the cherry fruit, the softness of the tannins makes Barbera a very, very easy drinking wine. And that high acidity makes it very, very food friendly. This is a perfect wine to have with more casual kind of dinners, like a pizza or, or hamburgers even. And they're really very moderately priced, so it's fantastic on the wallet. Now, on the bottle, you'll see that it says Barbera d'Asti. And Barbera is the name of the grape, and di, and then the region, Asti. And you'll see this on a lot of uh, Italian labels, and that can help you out somewhat. But it's not universal, as we've seen 
Barolo, it doesn't say Nebbiolo. So, but you can see this like Babera d'Asti, Babera d'Alba, uh, Brunello de Montalcino. But now let's go to the whites from Piedmont. We already know of one, uh, a sparkling wine called Muscato d'Asti that we talked about in lecture seven. The wine's made from Muscato grapes and comes from the region of Asti. Notice the name again that follows the rule you know, that we just talked about. Now let's move on to some still white wines. Cortese, Cortese is the name of a white grape that you'll find uh, in the DOCG region of Gavi. This area has some, some limestone-rich soils on the hillsides, which makes for white wine, great for white wines, and because of that acidity. Now, let's take a look at the color. Actually, you may want to take it in comparison to the Pinot Grigio. Notice how pale it is. It's very, very pale in color. And it actually has a little bit of a green hue to it in comparison to, let's say, the Pinot Grigio, or even the Suave, if you compare it to that. Now, these are generally unoaked uh, wines, but you do see some barrel fermented examples. And let's smell this. It smells very citrusy, very, very tangy. And also, you get a lot of mineral there as well. Some people actually have said that this smells like lime cordial. I mean, of course, it's not sweet. It's completely dry. But it kind of rem is reminiscent of that. So let's, let's taste it. It's extremely fresh, very delicate, very crisp, very clean. Um, but you notice the acidity right there, and that's going to be great with some, some delicate seafood. Another white wine in Piedmonte is Arneas. Now, traditionally, this grape was used to, to soften Nebbiolo's tannic structure, uh, but it's made in its, into its own wine now in the DOCG region of Roero. It has some beautiful floral perfume, but the wine is, is not very aromatic. I mean, most Italian white wines are more subtle in their aromas, which is a benchmark note um, uh, for me of almonds, uh, and this is the case with Arneas. Now let's go to northeastern Italy for another more popular white grape. Ever hear of Pinot Grigio? Of course you have. It's the number one white wine imported into the United States. Pinot Grigio is the Italian name for the French grape variety we spoke about, Pinot Gris. We touched on this in Lecture 11. Pinot Gris and Pinot Grigio are exactly the same grape, just like we have with uh, Shiraz and, and Syrah. Now let's take a look at our Pinot Grigio. In looking at the color, it has a little bit of a, a, a pink tinge to it. And remember, in, when we talked about it in, in Alsace, it's, uh, it actually, the grape variety itself is pink. So uh, it's not surprised to see that in there in comparison to, let's say, the Cortese. Now let's smell this. Not very aromatic. Hmm. In Alsace, we saw Pinot Gris as like a moderately uh, aromatic variety to a very aromatic grape variety. But in Italy, we don't see that too much. Um, the yields, meaning the amount of grapes you get from a particular vine, are much higher in Italy than you get in, in Alsace. And sometimes that can bring down some of the intensity of the aromas. However, some of the style of the aromas is going to be very similar. You do get some of that stone fruit, some of that spicy character um, that you get from Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio. Now, it's the number, white, number one white wine sold in the U.S. Why do we love Pinot Grigio so much? I'll tell you. Let's taste it, and, and uh, we'll find out. It's medium alcohol. It's medium fruit. It's medium acid. It's medium bodied. It's medium everything. Now, if you look at the bell curve of humanity, if you go towards the middle, you're going towards the most crowd-pleasing wine, and that's what it is. Pinot Grigio is the quintessential crowd-pleasing white wine. Now, the best Pinot Grigio comes from the region of Friuli, which borders Austria and Slovenia in northeastern Italy. The culture here, as you might expect, is a bit more Germanic. Uh, the grapes benefit from the airflows from the Alps, as well as from the Adriatic Sea. Another high-quality region of Pinot Grigio is Trentino Alto Adige, which are two separate regions, but they also border on Austria and Switzerland. This region used to be part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and still shows Germanic influences. 
So it's not surprising that you will also see Riesling and Gewurztraminer here, uh, which are very, but they're just like Pinot Grigio, they're much more delicate versions of their German or French cousins. Now here I have a Merlot from Trentino. Let's take a look at that. We had taken a look at Merlot in a couple of different lectures. Notice the color. For Merlot, which is a thick skin grape variety, this is actually really quite pale. This gives us an indication that it comes from a cool climate, and in Trentino is very cool. Now let's smell it. It still has those Merlot characteristics of, of, of plum and even, uh, even light blueberry, but it's much, much lighter. It, it smells lighter. Now let's taste it. Now you guys remember from the right bank of Bordeaux, we were tasting some really rich, chocolatey Merlots. They're really full-bodied. If you remember your notes and you look back at your notes, compare that to what you're tasting right now. This is one end of the spectrum for Merlot. It's light-bodied, it's, it's, very, it's very fruity, it's light-bodied, but it's a higher level of acidity and it's much more delicate. But that same varietal character comes through, which again makes Merlot a noble grape variety. Now let's go to one of my favorite regions, the Veneto. Why do I love it? The region of Veneto has the city of Venice in it. And whenever I'm tasting wines from this region, I imagine the majestic buildings and, um, over the water, the gondolas, the Piazza San Marco, and of course, Carnival and those gorgeous Venetian masks. Veneto produces more DOC wine than any other region in Italy, as well as the second best-selling wine in Italy called Suave. The country's number one wine, you might guess, is Chianti, which we'll cover in our next lecture. The region of Suave is a couple of hours' drive west of Venice, next to the region of Valpolicella, which is known for its red wines. If you have a Suave, compare the color to the Gave. You'll notice that the Suave is, a, is deeper in color and has more gold flecks in it. And when I was first learning about uh, the grape variety that makes up Suave, which is called Garganega, someone had said to me, it's very much like Chardonnay. And that, that's always helped me to kind of remember, oh, do I like Suave or do I not like Suave? Because I'm a big Chardonnay fan. So let's look at the aromas. Well, like Chardonnay, it seems in its intensity of its aromas, it's not as aromatic. So that's, that's a good clue. And when you smell the wine, you do get some of the citrusy and maybe even a hint of, um, of some of those uh, apples. But you also get more of an almondy kind of character, an almond note. Now, you may want to smell this in comparison to the Pinot Grigio. When you do that, you'll realize how floral and how m more nectarine and stone fruit that the Pinot Grigio is. Now let's taste it. Mm. If you taste it in comparison to the Pinot Grigio or the Gavi, you're going to realize how much fuller in body it is. Um, and that's very, very typical. Again, we're going towards a fuller bodied end of the spectrum for a white grape variety, which again, which is where, where Chardonnay is, but it's not as rich as sometimes some Chardonnays can get. Now, the region of Valpolicella to the west of Suave is known for its DOC red wines, blended from three different grape varieties called Corvina, Rondinella, and Molinara. Corvina is highly prized for its structure and its aromatics of sour cherry, uh, hints of herbs, while Rondinella does exactly what it sounds like it does. It rounds out the character, the body. And Molinara is added generally in small quantities to, to boost acidity. The basic red wine of Valpolicella is made just like most red wines. However, there's a style made here that has placed the region on the international scene for high quality. It's called Amarone. Amarone del Valpolicella, but we call it just Amarone for short. For many years, it was labeled DOC, but in December of 2009, it was granted DOCG status. And it's about time. Amarone is made from dried grapes 
of the Corvina, the Rondinella, and the Molinara. These grapes are picked and then laid out to dry for several months on bamboo mats in a process called apacimento. Well, why bamboo? Uh, the reason is, is when you cut open bamboo, it forms the semicircle. And if you put grapes on it and they happen to burst and some of the juice comes out, the grapes aren't sitting in the juice. Um, it just drains off. This prevents some microbial activity that could really cause some faulty aromas in the wine. The traditional style producers um, dry the grapes in lofts, while the more modern style producers, such as Masi, use a system called Natural Apacimento Super Assisted Program, which they love calling NASA. Now remember from when we spoke of drying grapes in Lecture 9? The water evaporates, leaving a concentrated, the concentrated sugars inside the grape. It's like, um, it's like making a reduction sauce in cooking. Once the grapes are dried to the right level, they're pressed, uh, fermented dry, and matured in oak barrels. Now, some producers include a portion of the Corvina grapes that have developed botrytis. This is the fungus called noble rot, which we mentioned in Lecture 9. The, the botrytis adds a stone fruit and honeyed character to, to the Corvina grapes, and this adds much more layers of complexity. Now, let's look at the color of the Amarone versus the color of the Nebbiolo of our Barolo here. You'll notice it's much deeper, much, much deeper in color. You can barely see your fingers through it, if, if at all. Now, let's see. It's not as aromatic as the Nebbiolo, but one of the great, great benchmarks for Amarone is chocolate-covered cherries. Now, also, the type of fruit that you get here is, smells like more dried fruit, and that's for a reason. It's because it's made from dried grapes. Now, let's taste it. It's very dense, and it's, very, it's got a very kind of chocolatey kind of texture. If you've ever put dark chocolate in your mouth and you let it sit there and you roll your tongue around, it very, very much feels that way, but it's completely, completely dry. Now, there's also a style there called Recciotto um, that people often get confused between Amarone and Recciotto. Amarone is fermented complete to dryness, while Recciotto is stopped somewhere before it's complete, so you get that little bit of residual sugar, and it's more of a dessert wine. Now, Amarone has, has rich, dense uh, tan tannins, and it gives you that bitterness in your back palate. And the name Amarone derives from the word for bitter in Italian, which is amaro. Now, um, it gets to, uh, as you age it, it gets softer and definitely more plush, and more modern styles are, are less bitter. Uh, but also, notice on your back palate that, that warmth that you get there. Look on the bottle, uh, look on the label and find the alcohol level. It's probably close to about 16%, if not more. And because remember, when we dry the sugar, it turns into higher levels of alcohol after fermenta fermentation is complete. And even though it's high in alcohol for most wines, the richness and concentration of the fruit balances with the dense tannins and, and the warm alcohol balances everything all beautifully. I mean, I love Amarone for its many layers of flavors as it ages. It gains such complexity. There's even a stage called um, the lavender stage that Amarone goes through, uh, which makes the Amarone smell of lavender. Now, the best food, the best food and wine pairing I've ever had is with Amarone. It was an Amarone paired, actually this Amarone, paired with a Parmigiano Reggiano, uh, the cheese and chunks of it, and it had honey drizzled all over it. It seemed to touch every single taste bud. It was absolutely heavenly. You should try it. One last style you may see that's almost a cross between basic Valpolicella and Amarone is Ripasso. Traditionally, what would happen is that a winemaker would want to beef up uh, his Valpolicella, so he would just take the skins from the Amarone tank and throw them into the Valpolicella tank for a while. As the Amarone's alcohol is about 16%, um, we know that alcohol is an extracting agent. So these skins uh, have a lot more tannin and color, um, which they add to the Valpolicella. 
This is done um, by still some traditional style producers such as uh, Bertani. However, producers like Masi use fresh dried grapes instead, instead of using those Amarone skins, because they say that when you use old Amarone skins, it adds a bitterness to the wine, kind of like um, using a tea bag more than once. These Ripasso styled wines taste fresh like the Valpolicella, but, but richer and deeper. So they're kind of like a, a baby Amarone, and they can be incredible values. I offered this wine to my family at Thanksgiving, and they couldn't get enough of it. Now, here we are at the end of Lecture 13, and it's time for another mystery quiz, because now you've covered all the basics plus a few regions. So see if you can identify these two wines based on my description, or at least start eliminating what it can't be. Now here we have mystery wine number one. Let's take a look at the color. It's straw yellow with um, flecks of gold in it. So is this from a cool climate? Does this have any oak in it? Maybe. Now let's look at the aromatic intensity. Don't smell it here. No, no, don't really smell it here either. I have to stick my nose in the glass. And so if I have to stick my nose in the glass, what does that tell you? Is it an aromatic grape variety or something else? Yeah, well, it's not a, an intensely aromatic, so we can rule out aromatic grape varieties such as Gewürztraminer, Riesling, or Sauvignon Blanc. Now, what type of aromas I get? I get apple aromas, but I also get minerals as well, which could lead us to the old world. I also get a little bit of butter, and I also get some vanilla, toast, and spice. What do you think that tells us? That it could be oaked. Now let's taste it. This is a full-bodied white wine. It's high acidity, but it's very well balanced. It's got a medium level of alcohol, but it's got a very creamy texture. Seamless balance and a very, very, very long finish. So if it's got all of that, what quality level do you think it is? Is it low quality, medium quality, or high quality? It's high quality. It's definitely above $25 for sure. So what do you think it is? We've got a non-aromatic grape variety from the old world that sees some oak. Hmm. You think it's a Chardonnay? Could be. What we have here is a Merceau. Well done. So let's try another. Remember, this is just practice and it's a fun way to learn. So you might try this some night with a, a few friends. Okay, mystery wine number two. Let's take a look at the color. Oh, this is very inky purple, actually. So what do you think that means? Is it a thin skin grape variety or a thick skin grape variety? Yeah, so it being a thick-skinned grape variety, you're probably going to have to rule out thinner-skinned grape varieties like Pinot Noir or, or Berbera. So what could this be? Oh, it could be Cab, it could be Merlot, it could be um, Syrah. Now let's smell it. I get some black currant, some, some cassis kind of notes, and, and, and a bit of licorice, so it could be Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and I get some toast here as well. Yeah, a little bit of vanilla and toast. Let's taste it. Okay, it's sweet. So we can actually rule out what we've tasted with Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and Syrah. It's very full-bodied. Got well-balanced acidity, very, very firm, firm grip, these strong tannins and a very long finish, but also, wait, very high level of alcohol. So it's not a normal level of alcohol, it's actually much higher, so what do you think? It's probably been fortified. So what gives us a thick-skinned opacity, some toast notes, um, and sweetness? Happens to be a port, and a vintage port at that. So you see? 
We're more than halfway through this course and you've begun to be able to smell and taste a wine to determine if it's a, a thin skin grape variety or a thick skin grape variety, if it's a, a noble grape, if it's a, a special style such as a fortified wine. So great job. In our next lecture, we'll go to central and southern Italy. Chianti is the most popular wine in Italy and the most popular Italian red wine in the world. Chianti Classico was one of my first favorite transporting wines. As I mentioned earlier in, in an earlier lecture, when I drink it, I feel like uh, I'm at a villa under the Tuscan sun and feeling the, the Tuscan sun on my face. And I can smell the oregano and the, and the basil in the air. And let me tell you, nothing goes better with tomato sauce than the wines from Tuscany. We Americans love Italian food, and the wines from the next lecture will be great to go to go to um, when you're at a, dining at an Italian restaurant. You're going to need a Chianti. I prefer a Chianti Classico, but here we have a, a Chianti, Chianti Classico, or Chianti Classico Riserva. So there's some options. Here, a, a Super Tuscan. This is Sassicaia. It's a Super Tuscan wine. And then a white from, from southern Italy or central Italy, such as uh, either Greco di Tufo, we have Lacrima Cristi, Falangina, and we even have a, a Chardonnay here as well. As long as it comes from this area, it's okay. Then we go to have an Alianico, you know, or a Torossi, Primitivo, and a Nero Davola. I leave you with an ancient Latin proverb. It is well to remember that there are five reasons for drinking. The arrival of a friend, one's present or future thirst, the excellence of the wine, and any other reason. So, salute and grazie mille.